Can you make something out of nothing? I know someone who can. Stay with us as we learn together who that someone is. Greetings, dear friends. My name is Marvin Clark. And I'm Judy Clark. And together, we're going to be looking at an uh, amazing, exciting topic. It's the uh, topic of creation. What does the Bible say about creation? You're going to see a verse tonight or two that uh, might surprise you and maybe even floor you. Here we go. Creation. Psalm 33 is where we're going to go first, the 33rd Psalm, and watch what takes place here as the Bible describes how God did His creative work. It is amazing. The psalmist says, Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp, sing unto Him with the psaltery and an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. Now, <laughs> here it comes. It goes from that, showing how good God is, to how he did his creative work. And here it comes, Psalms 33, verse 6. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made. Hang on to that. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Put the pieces together. It gets better. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as a heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. It means respect the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Why? Why? Here it is, verse 9. For He spake, or because He spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. Did you get it? When God creates, He does not need pre-existing matter to do his creating. He, he brings things into existence from nothing. He, he doesn't need any pieces to make anything. He starts with nothing and he ends up with something. Now, that's because God's word contains creative power to accomplish whatever he speaks. Can I do that again? God's Word contains, contained in His Word, is the creative power to accomplish whatever it is that He speaks. Now, Judy, this is amazing because at least two places in the Bible we're told God cannot lie. One says it's actually impossible that God could tell a lie. Now, how does that work? Here's how it works. If God would, would take this Bible here and uh, say, this Bible is green. Guess what would happen? It would be green. It would be green, all right? I can say it would be green, it would be purple, it would be orange all day long, and nothing would happen. But if God said it was green, even though it's red, it would suddenly become green. Because, why? Because God's Word contains creative power to accomplish whatever he says. Isn't that neat? That's neat. So that's why it's impossible for God to tell a lie. Because if he spoke a lie, it would suddenly become truth. It would become whatever he said. This Bible here, your Bible, if God walked in here today and said, this Bible is uh, rainbow color. There's all kinds of different colors on this Bible, front and back. And we're looking at it and say, what are you talking about? It's a blue Bible. But as soon as he spoke those words and said it's a rainbow-colored Bible, guess what? <laughs> You'd be looking at a rainbow. If I said, 
I am holding in my hand here a magnificent, very, very expensive million dollar diamond. And I opened my hand, uh, no diamond fell out, nothing crashed on the floor, uh, it just didn't happen. If God was sitting here in this chair right now, today, and said, I'm holding in my hand a beautiful, very expensive, about a million dollars worth, in fact, polished diamond. And he opened his hand, guess what would fall out? The diamond. A diamond is right. And it wasn't in there to begin with, but it got there when he spoke those words. Because his words contain creative power to accomplish whatever he speaks. The neat thing for us, Judy, in that concept is any promise we find in the Word of God, we can bet our life on. Because God has spoken it, so it has to happen. Now, it might not be in the very way that we would anticipate it happening, but it has to happen because God spoke it. So, again, we can bet our life on the Word of God, and that's exactly what Christians have done. Here's an amazing verse from the New Testament that shows someone, an actual person in the New Testament that Jesus met, that understood and believed and shared the concept that we're looking at right now. What is that concept? That God's Word contains creative power to accomplish whatever He speaks. Check this out. It's in Matthew chapter 8, verse 4. Five. Matthew, the 8th chapter, we'll look at verses 5 through 10. Now, amazing story. When Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, a Roman soldier, beseeching him. What did the Roman soldier want? Let's find out. He said to Jesus, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. So this centurion had a servant, which was common to have servants in the time of Christ. And apparently the centurion and the servant were very close. They became friends. And the centurion hears that Jesus is a, not just a master teacher, but a master healer as well, and he tracks Jesus down. He finds him so Jesus can heal his servant. Verse 7, Matthew 8. And Jesus now speaks. He says unto him, I will come and heal him. Okay? Here's Jesus offering to come to the home of this centurion and heal his servant. Now watch ever so closely what the centurion said. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant will be healed. Did you get it? Yeah. Did you get it? Speak the word only. This centurion understood that God's words contain creative power to accomplish whatever he speaks. You don't have to go to my home. Just say the word healed, and it's taken care of. Now, <laughs> for I'm a man under authority, the centurion says. I have soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goes. I say to another one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, the words of the centurion, he marveled, and he said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in all of Israel. Woo! This centurion impressed Jesus with his knowledge of the Scriptures and his belief that God's word contains creative power to accomplish whatever he speaks. And that's how Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father brought this world into existence and everything in it. They spoke those things into existence. Judy, I, I know that you do uh, a lot of teaching in your classroom, but I've also seen you do a lot of teaching outside your classroom. Uh, why would you do that, and, and what's up? with the uh, idea of teaching outside rather than inside? 
You know, taking children out into nature brings, I mean, nature is considered God's second book. And if it's his second book, we need to integrate their learning in the outdoors. It's as simple as taking them for a walk or working in the garden or letting them play in the playground and then they observe things and then the topic can go right into creation and to God and his love. Like just um, a couple days ago, we were outside playing and they were having recess and running around and one of the girls comes running up and says, teacher, teacher, look, look at what we found. Isn't this cool? And they'd gone over to some shrubs and had seen some of the leaves on the shrubs changing colors. And they look and they said, look, teacher, this is like life, death, and in between. And I said, you're right. So what, what do you think about that? And they said, well, God put in this little leaf for us to see that he's creating all of these things in our lives and we don't have to be sad. He makes it beautiful. Mm. And I said, you're right. It's not just green. It's not just brown. And it's not just white. It's a combination of the colors. And you can take simple things like that and help guide them back to creation and what God is doing in their life. I think what I find so fascinating the older I get and the more I get to be and spend time with grandchildren and, and other young people. You're still young, by the way. Oh, thank you. Very young. Thank you. Um, when I go and take our grandchildren out for a walk, it gives me the opportunity to listen at their level and to help guide them in some of these concepts because I don't get to be with them every day. And I know their parents love them and do their best, but as a Mimi, I can kind of add in a little extra. So like with our grandson, nobody likes to touch bugs and stuff. So I determined that I was not going to let bugs bother me. So Branston, our grandson, and I have kind of gotten into this bug thing. He even knows more than I do on some of it. But we got outside and we were playing with bugs. And he sees this big, creepy, crawly thing. And he goes, Mimi, you pick it up. <laughs> and I said, OK, I'll pick it up. He says, you're not scared? I go. No, I'm not scared. It's okay. I can pick it up. Do you want me to? No, I'll do it. I said, okay, you do it. So he puts his hand down there, and, and I take my hand and kind of gently guide it, and it starts crawling on his hand. He goes, ooh, that tickles. And I go, mm-hmm, it sure does. I said, look at how it moves. Are you making it move? No. I wonder who created it to be like that. He goes, silly be me. You know God did it. And I said, I, I wondered if you thought God made that bug. Then as we got going, and he wanted to keep that bug and keep it as a treasure, he was carrying it around like this, and then all of a sudden he goes, Ooh, Mimi, it spit on me. <laughs> and I go, isn't that fun? God knew that you needed to see and understand that he creates things for fun for you and for me to enjoy. And I bet there's a whole lot of other bugs out here in this area that you would love to explore and, and find. There are moments like these that you can take just a breather of a moment with a child. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we get so caught up in our days that we forget that it's just the simple, didn't cost anything other than taking a moment of my time. What does my little buddy Branston remember? Mimi loves bugs. And not only that, Mimi and he have a bond that is created from God and his creation. And you can take simple walks like with my granddaughters, and I'm starting with my little baby ones too. And we go for walks, and I'll stop on the stroller and say, mm -hmm. look at, see what God has made for mm -hmm. you. That is so neat. I, I see now why you would go outside to teach. Yes. You're able to uh, direct the attention of the students or your grandchildren, our grandchildren, to the uh, things you find in nature and say these just didn't appear here. These were made by uh, God, but not just by God. They were made by a loving, caring God that put color and design into all of those things that, that you're, uh, you're seeing. So yes. That is really neat. And children seem to have a natural desire for science and the natural things. 
And that makes it really fun yeah. to be able to share those moments with them. Great. And you'll find that no matter, you'll say, well, I can't do that. There's no way I can. It's so simple. A child will lead you. They'll lead you in that conversation. They'll ask you questions. It's are you willing to spend the time with them and answer their question and guide them to mm -hmm. the creator of the universe. Absolutely. What a challenge and what a privilege that is to guide them to the creator, the loving creator of yes. the universe. Uh, Judy and I, you've prob probably figured out by now, are uh, desiring to make these programs family friendly. And each of the programs that we do uh, is, is geared that way. I will look at the uh, theology and show the Bible verses, and Judy will show the practical side of how to uh, implement these verses in teaching your children. So that's what we're doing, and we're so glad you're a part of these programs. Let's just go to Creation Week on the, in the first page of the Bible, Judy. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, and the word Genesis means beginnings, and let's start at the beginning. Seven days of Creation Week. Now, this is a controversial topic. It doesn't have to be. Uh, I can't understand uh, too many deep and complex things like millions and billions of years. That's well beyond me, but I can understand that he made some amazing things in six days and rested the seventh. Let's check it out. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The word God there, by the way, is plural, which means there was more than one person involved in creation. Let's find out who, who was involved in creation. Verse 2, the last part, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So here's God the Father, here's the Spirit of God, and in Colossians 1, John 1 and Hebrews chapter 1, all those three places tell us that Jesus was the active agent in creation. They all say that. So we've got the whole Trinity here. We did a program on the Trinity not too long ago. And all three members of the Godhead or all three members of the Trinity were involved in that creation process. All right? Let's find out how it went. Verse 3, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Did you get it? He said the word light, and what happened? Bam! Instantly. Now. Not even a 64th of a second went by. As soon as he spoke the word light, bam, there it was. It appeared. Darkness was gone. Why? Because God's word contains creative power to accomplish whatever he speaks. He said light, bam. There it was. There it is. Day one, light. And verse 7, God made the firmament. He divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And God called the firmament heaven. That's where we're going one of these days, our eternal home. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Let's look at the third day. God said, let the, verse 11, let the earth bring forth grass an herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit. That sounds good. We're going to be eating fruit off a fruit tree in that place called heaven one of these days. The book of Revelation tells us a new fruit comes on that tree every month. I can't wait. I like mangoes. I like guavas. I like fresh pineapple. The fruit in the tree of heaven probably will exceed by far all of those fruits. I can't wait to try them. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. Let's go to the fourth day. Uh, God made two great lights. He made the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light He made to rule the night, and He made the stars also. Fourth day, sun, moon, and stars. And the evening and the morning, okay, a 24-hour time period, all of these days, were the fourth day. Not too tricky. Just take it for as it reads. The fifth day, he made birds and fish. And the evening and the morning, he says, were the fifth day. Let's go to day six. <clears throat> the headline is, in my Bible, the sixth day, animals and man. Okay, that's where we come into the picture. And God said, verse 24, let the earth bring forth living creature. And God made the beast of the earth, the cattle, everything that creepeth upon the earth, like you and your or our grandson, uh, pick up those little critters. 
He made those on the sixth day. So God created man also in his own image. In the, in the image of God created he him and he her. Male and female created he them. And again, Judy, it says, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Clearly, 24-hour time periods. Why try to turn this into millions or billions of years? We don't have to. The Bible doesn't want us to. But he didn't stop there. One more thing happened on creation week, and this is kind of exciting. In chapter 2, the first three verses, check this out. And the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. He got done with all of his work of creating. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had made. And then God did something to that seventh day. He blessed it. He sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. We're going to have a whole program on that seventh day uh, in the near future here. But right now we can just say that uh, uh, the seven days of creation week clearly, just take it as it reads, are seven 24-hour time periods. And we still have that seven-day weekly cycle today, do we not? Yes. And we've been known to rest on that day. It doesn't mean go to sleep. It means to <laughs> have a good time and, and not have to stress out punching a time clock and and uh, driving to work and those kinds of things. It's getting out in nature. It's studying His Word. It's a totally different kind of refreshment. And I look forward to that one, too, because so many family and young people things can be done. This topic excites me, and it's real hard for me to, to sit back and, and <laughs> not share. But creation is just such a vast opportunity from very small, the counting of seven, counting up to seven, the taking and spending time with each one of those days and exploring, going out and laying down on the ground and looking up at the night sky and letting the children watch the shooting stars or look into, into space, and they'll open up and ask you so many questions. From that to going to the soil to knowing that if God had scrambled up that order of the seven, mm -hmm. How would humanity have fit in? Where would we have had air to breathe? There's just so many wonderful, exciting things that you can do with just this topic of, in the beginning, God created. And you are doing it. And what a, what a, a joy that is for the students. And I love having that chance with our children and our grandchildren and being able to talk to our adult children about this same topic, too. Isn't that neat? Yeah. Judy, in your lap, and you've been yes. waiting patiently to share this, yes. are some, or is some artwork that your students and your grandchildren or our grandchildren have, have uh, come up with. How does it yes. work? You know, children can take something and create something from nothing. And when you can help them to understand that when they have a blank piece of paper and you give them an idea, they can come up and create an idea and show it to us on the paper. That helps them to kind of get an understanding on how God could speak something and make it happen. Mm -hmm. We have to also put things into their brain, and that's where we have to be careful what we feed them with mm -hmm. um, for that spiritual growth. But here's things like simple from the very beginning of drawing, like here's my papa and my mimi, and, and it's quite interesting to see the detail that they come up with in their interpretation of what you and I look like with long legs and all of that, <laughs> to going to creating visions of art. How old was that uh, student, do you think? That this is our granddaughter. Oh, my. Yeah, our granddaughter Ariana, did that. Ariana made it when she was five. Oh, my. Five years old. Five years old. And okay. she was going through and immolating something that she had seen in an art book that she enjoyed from here's, here's an interpretation of... Uh, what you know that she thought she might be looking like or you know we we're talking about mm. stories about angels and things too and then going all the way to when uh, young people get older and you talk to them about how the world looks and you know and creation and what we've done to it and what could we do to actually change and they created fish and a whole system here of how we can mess it up 
but how together we should be taking care of what God has created. Now, I understand that right next to your classroom is a, a, a stream that still has water in it. We have two creeks two that creeks. run right by the school, mm -hmm. and the young people, through reading a story book about how children made a difference, have already been working together with the state and how to, to reclaim the stream and Wonderful. purify it. So they're clean, cleaning the stream out with the uh, government's help. Yes, we're working with the city and um, state. And these are just their interpretations on ways that they can work together to make a difference in their community. How neat. That is terrific. So they're learning from the classroom that God created everything out of nothing. Yes. And you give them a piece of paper or a poster board like this. And to understand how God did that, they're creating something basically out of nothing on the paper yes. or on the poster board in a little different way, but it'll help them understand how God created this world and everything in it. Yes. That's neat. And it's wonderful to take time to let them tell you and explain to you their interpretation of what they have created. So our viewers out there, the mothers and fathers, are able, would be able, if they so choose, to uh, get their children more involved with nature and through all those beautiful little bugs and the trees and, and what grows in a garden, these spiritual lessons just come in so nicely, so naturally. And all it costs is time. Just a little bit of time. Prioritizing our time. And dear ones, all of that is in the Bible.